Yeah, it's because all that stuff like that we see in Scares Us as kids, it kind of just sits in our mind. Ready to be reawoken as adults. Are you afraid of the dark? Hello, yes, this video is brought to you by YouTube's most ironic sponsor, Ship Keeps. I knew that something was wrong as soon as I woke up in the morning and first noticed that blood was oozing down the walls of my bedroom. Holy shit. <laughs> Danny's nightmares. I raced downstairs to grab the attention of a responsible grown-up, but I was mortified to discover that my entire family had been tied to a makeshift altar by a pack of werewolf children. And they were now being sacrificed to Diana Dawes. Who the f is Diana Dawes? Oh. Mercifully, it was only moments later they woke up, woke up in a pool of sweat and realized that the whole thing had just been a disturbingly vivid nightmare. Sometimes even as an adult, I'll wake up and I'm just covered in sweat. And it'd be like, Oh my god, I must have been having some intense dream that I'm super glad I don't remember because I am dripping. <laughs> Either that or someone in the comments is going to tell me that I've got a deadly medical condition and my days are numbered. But as I peeked open a cautious eye, I couldn't help but notice that my bedroom walls were still dripping with blood and there was a fearful howling coming from downstairs. Oh my- oh. Wait, hello there, welcome to another episode of Brain Blaze. feel like I should introduce myself, explain what's going on for newcomers, because you're probably like, who is this? What is going on? What have I clicked on? What happens in this corner of YouTube? It's filled with damage. I'm Simon. I read a script that Danny has written then afterwards. Sam. Hmm. He's gonna sprinkle in some of the finest vintage memes you've ever seen. Some people call him a video editor. Some people don't. I was trying to come up with, you know, one of those things where it's like some people from uh, from Top Gear, but then I'm not bright enough, so I just came up with one. Now, say my name. Uh, other than memologist. So, that's what's happening here. Let's ca carry on. You're goddamn right. There's a tissue in my pocket. It felt slightly uncomfortable. How dare you! My brother and I often got packed off to spend the weekends at my grandparents so that mum and dad could go out and get smashed on Saturday night with zero responsibility. As the father of a one and a half, well, nearly two year old now, two in November, a uh, one year old daughter and another one coming soon, it's like, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, I remember drinking with my wife vaguely, it was a long time ago. <laughs> it's just been a long time since we went out for a couple of beers. Oh my. And the cool thing about staying with our grandparents is that they let us stay up late to see the kinds of things on TV that we normally wouldn't be allowed to watch. When I went to stay with my grandma, we'd, we'd watch stuff on the TV, but she had this like TV, I swear to God, it was from like the 1960s. It was color, but that was about the only revolution. It didn't have a remote control. It was pre-remote control. So you had to stand up and go press this giant switch to like change the channel. It had four channels um, and it was about this big and the picture quality, you had to, like, if the picture quality was a bit off, you had these dials that you could tune to, like, get, it, it was, it, I mean, man, buy a better TV, come on. Stuff like the gripping anthropology series Hammer House of Horror, which often featured chilling stories involving werewolf children, people getting trapped in recurring nightmares, and houses that bled to death. Oh my, what if the house bleeds, Seth? Oh no, the house died. Uh, okay, good. I hope I've got a good insurance policy. This sounds like a very boring dream. The fuck is he talking about? The downside is that we were then sent to bed under a blanket of sheer terror to endure the whole night of bad dreams and regret. Yeah, I remember being a kid and I'd stay up late and I'd watch The X-Files and every time I'd be like, what have I done? <laughs> I am afraid to turn off the lights. <laughs> I'm afraid. And I always used to make myself feel better because Friends was on after the X-Files. So I'd watch the X-Files for like an hour and then I'd watch Friends for like half an hour. And then I'd always be like, yeah, 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 Friends will make me feel better. And then it did. And then Friends would end and I'd just, my mind would return to the terror that was the X-Files. It's like, oh, for fuck's sake. I'm afraid to believe. I remember seeing The Sixth Sense when it first came out on DVD. I must have been like 12. I was afraid all the time that I'd turn the corner and I'd see dead people. <laughs> what are we talking about, Simon? Stop talking about your life and get to the, what are we, I don't, what is this video about? What am I doing with my life? Christ. But at least when we properly woke up the next morning after the walls had stopped bleeding and the howls had finally subsided, we could at least wrap ourselves in the reassuring duvet of Sunday morning TV for children. Except that quite often children's TV shows were even more dark and depraved. Oh, that's right. 
children's TV shows that are all kinds of f***ed up. In fact, children's TV has probably given us more recurring nightmares and lifelong phobias than the entire pantheon of X-rated horror slashes all squashed together on the dusty shelves of an old blockbuster store. The point is that we're usually a bit older and a bit more switched on when we get the chance to view adult-oriented material, but children's TV has the capacity to get under our skin and into the darkest recesses of our imagination from a young and impressionable age, and it has the power to mentally scar us for life when the boundaries were pushed just a little bit too far. I have to say, I don't really remember being scared by any children's TV shows as a kid. Obviously, you could be like, yeah, that's creepy as an adult. But as a kid, I don't remember being scared of anything. It's a human centipede. Holy sh! <laughs> That's a f***ed up movie. Might be a challenging watch as an adult, but it's not going to leave the same traumatic impact in your soul as a particularly spooky episode of Goosebumps that you watched when you were still drinking Panda Pops. Yeah, Goosebumps was a cool TV show. I liked that. Yeah, I guess that was kind of scary, but it was intended to be scary for kids. As an adult, you'd be like. <laughs> This is ridiculous. I don't know, I just, why not just show your kids the human centipede if you really want to scare the sh out of them? I know that everyone will have that would. Uh, can you imagine showing a child the human centipede? Be like, oh my god. That is going to require tens of thousands of pounds of therapy. I know that everyone will have their own examples of TV terror for tots, and we can only cover a few examples in this relatively brief script. Danny, you make me feel like an idiot. Everyone's got an example of TV they were scared of as a kid. Everyone, except for your fact boy here. But if there's enough audience demand, then we can always make several return visits and turn this into an endless recurring nightmare where they keep bleeding down the walls of your mind for the rest of your life. Well, all of that depends, Danny, on how many people watch this. And also, how many people invest. I say invest in a full head of hair. Not your boy, obviously. Why does this sponsorship for anti-balding stuff come from the bald fact boy? And I'm like, well, the reality is, if I could use this, to bring back my glorious hair, I would. The problem is, it only works before you've lost your hair. Unfortunately. <laughs> Did you know that two out of every three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35? No, I had no idea, actually. No idea, because for me it was 25. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you crying? <laughs> I wish Keeps had been around when I was young. Oh my god, I said that already, but yeah, I mean, it, look. If I, I, I was, I was sure I was going bald because my dad is mega bald. I don't know about my, like, actually my uncle's not bald. My granddad's, they, they died before I was born. So I don't really know, like, uh, if they were bald. I don't think so. No, I'm pretty sure I've seen photographs of them. They weren't bald. You know, I just realized I don't really know what my granddad on my dad's side looks like. <laughs> That's kind of depressing. I mean, I never really thought about it, but I don't know if he was bald or not. That's a weird thought. Look, I was, but the reality was I was pretty sure I was going to go bald. And then I was like, oh, look, I'm going bald. And I could have stopped it with keeps, couldn't I? But I didn't, because it wasn't around back then. It was a good 10-something years ago. Uh, also, you don't have to go broke doing it. Like, I say this in all these reads. It's like, you might be thinking, oh, this is medicine. <laughs> it's time to take out my wallet. <laughs> Swipe that credit card and get ready to pay. But no, with keeps, is actually quite affordable. Say, so very affordable. Starts at just $10 a month, which, uh, that's pretty good. Like, to keep your hair. I mean, <laughs> um, no need to visit a doctor's office either. You just go online. They give you a quick online consult. Discreet package arrives at your door. Hello there. Use it in the comfort of your own home and you're good to go. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com forward slash business blaze or click the link in the description below to receive 50% of your first order. That's keeps.com slash business blaze. And that's a good deal, folks. Link below. Let's carry on. Mr. Nosy Boink. I'm not sure if this is completely true, as I haven't watched children's TV for a while, but there's certainly a suggestion from some quarters that modern kids' TV is usually played quite safe, and they've got away with some far crazier sh** in the olden days. It often felt as if the producers from decades gone by were purposefully trying to get children cowering behind the sofa in blind fear. But one of the most genuinely disturbing characters to have merged from UK television wasn't meant to even be that frightening. It was more just a case of terrible design. Yeah, the accidental stuff is almost more terrifying sometimes, isn't it? It's like, whoops. <laughs> that sh just became mega cursed. The TV show Jigsaw aired from 1979 to 1984 and was sold as an entertaining, puzzle-based show for studios children between the ages of four and seven. Who liked having the 
get scared out of them. Each week, the presenters would pose a number of fiendish puzzles related to that episode's mystery word. <laughs> Imagine if the mystery word is murder, death, kill. Uh, and viewers would be helped along by comic sketches and performances, which would serve up fresh clues. <laughs> Eyeballs! Gouging! Daddy, chill. From the second season onwards, viewers were introduced to the character of Mr. Nosybonk, who frequently popped up in these sketches to shed more light on the mystery word. He didn't say an awful lot. In fact, he was completely mute, and he was played by a professional mime artist, Adrian Headley, already starting from a dark place there. Because miming's also rather weird and scary, isn't it? It's like, what's with the white face? Like, super scary pale. Why are you not making any sounds? Why are you sad? I don't understand you. I don't understand miming. Each wacky sketch was played out in the style of a short silent film, accompanied by an incredibly repetitive tune which was probably meant to sound quite jolly, but took on a mysterious haunting quality when married to the action on screen. The problem is that Mr. Nosybonk looked incredibly sinister. His butler suit and white gloves were okay, but his head was something else. Mr. Nosybonk wore a giant white mask with, which displayed an unsettling frozen grin wide offset eyes. It's the offset eyes that are so creepy. It's like Mr. Blobby is once pointing that way, once pointing that way. It's like, ah! Mr. Blobby, why? And an absolutely massive Pinocchio style nose, which looked like he was modeling a giant white dick on his face. Ah! Mr. Nosy Bonk was actually a dickhead. His behavior was deeply odd, too. Come on, let me hear you say it just once. Come on. Thought. No! <laughs> no, I want the other thing. Come on, I know it's just dangling off the tip of your tongue. Let me hear it just once, please. Throughout many of the short sketches, he gave the impression that he was on the run from the police. He skulked in the shadows and lurked outside of public toilets. He performed weird experiments, which often led to him getting chased away by citizens who were clearly just concerned for the safety of their children. Jigsaw hadn't meant to create a monster. Mr. Nosybonk was clearly intended to be a fun, wacky character in line with the rest of the educational show, but the curious combination of his sneaky, prowling behavior, giant phallic nose, maniacal grin, dead, vacant, dead eyes, and his cold silence against a teeth-grinding soundtrack on a continuous loop had accidentally created a character that would have looked more at home in a slasher movie. All he was missing was a massive chainsaw. Although he thankfully disappeared back into his own haunted sex dungeon when Jigsaw was act in 1984, Mr. Nosybonk made a very unofficial return in 2008 when the online UK comedian Stuart Ashen released a series of parody videos on YouTube which fleshed out the character and offered a little more insight into his backstory. <laughs> Legend! The new incarnation of Mr. Nosybonk is seen solving a pentagram puzzle which summons the devil. Baking a nice cake in which he tops off with the skin from a human face. Ah, oh, And rearranging the magnetic letters on the fridge to spell out, I will eat your soul. This is brilliant. Perhaps the character's biggest legacy of all is that he went on to directly inspire the creation of Mr. Chuckle Teeth in the 2018 episode of The X-Files. The X-Files was still being made in 2018? What the fuck, really? What to Mulder and Scully? They... They surely aren't on it anymore, because I've seen Mulder, um, what's his name? David Dutch something, Dutch Chovnik, Dutch Dutch Covey, Dutch something, Dachovny, Dachovny? David Dutch, look, David, he's been in lots of other <laughs> and I've seen, um, what's her face? Scully. Oh my god, I'm totally drawing a blank on her name, and she's more famous than the other dude, right? <laughs> ah, doesn't matter, but they've been in lots of other stuff. So I'm guessing they're not doing the X-Files anymore. Uh, which was deemed by critics to be one of the scariest episodes ever produced. Mr. Chuckleteeth lures a lung young boy into the forest before mauling him to death. Honestly, I quite want to watch the X-Files because I'm looking for a new TV show right now. And if they're really still making it, I like that. I'm into that. That's shit! The X-Files is an American. Oh my god, they're still making it! That's insane! Ah, oh, okay, so they started remaking it in 2016. Did it get cancelled after one season? So that was a fucking lie. Come on. Come on. David Duchovny and Gillian Anderson, of course Gillian Anderson, are back. That is sick. I'm so excited to watch that. That's what I'm doing tonight. The yeah, X-Files is back, baby. How do I just find out about this now? Mr. Truckteeth lures a young boy into the forest before mauling him to death, which admittedly is taking the horror up a notch from anything we saw on Jigsaw. But bearing in mind that the X-Files has a reputation for mining only the most 
fearful concepts to be buried deep within our psyche, it's intriguing that one of the show's darkest ever episodes was based on a palace of petrified panic that is good old fashioned kids TV. Yeah, it's because all that stuff like that we see and scares us as kids, it kind of just sits in our mind, ready to be reawoken as adults. Are you afraid of the dark? In 1990, someone had the bright idea of taking the horror anthology format and twisting it into a spellbinding new TV show for kids. And along the way, created something that was often creepier than the stuff that the grown ups were watching on The Twilight Zone or The Outer Limits. Oh my god, I never saw The Twilight Zone. I think it was a bit old. But The Outer Limits, I enjoyed the shit of. Out of. The shit of. The shit of when I was younger. And then I decided to rewatch it, like, more recently, and I'm like, eh, it hasn't aged particularly well, has it? There's just been so much good TV since the 90s, that it's like, all those 90s shows that you loved, like Sliders, it's a little bit, you know, it's just like, yeah, but then we got ruined by Breaking Bad, didn't we? You're goddamn right. A Year Afraid of the Dark was a joint American-Canadian production which enjoyed an initial run between 1990 and 1996 on Nickelodeon in the US and Hawaii TV in Canada. It boasted early appearances from the likes of Ryan Gosling and Melissa Joan Hart. There you have it! But this was certainly no silly, dumbed-down show featuring cartoon-style ghosts going bump in the night. A Year Afraid of the Dark often went for the jugular. The framing device of every episode involved a group of teenagers who called themselves the Midnight Society who met up every night around a campfire in the woods where a member of the gang would share their latest spooky tale from the crypt of heebie-jeebies. Wow, those kids have an interesting life. To one, be let out every night to go and have a campfire in the woods. <laughs> I don't think I did that once in my childhood. I mean, of course I did, but like not every night. And then also, e e how, how many kids are there? A small group, it's gonna be a group, so let's say there's five of them, or 10 of them even. They have enough scary stories to fill every night. Their lives are intense. <laughs> I'm in danger! And this would lead to a surprisingly dark story which might involve ghosts of children who froze to death in a lake, vampires stalking the local hospital, demonic clowns who follow you home from the funfair, or kids getting turned into little porcelain dolls to spend an eternity trapped in the neglected dollhouse in the attic. Holy sh**. One of the more mem- <laughs> One of the more memorable episodes was entitled Tale of Dead Man's Float, in which a couple of kids discover a secret swimming pool in their school, which was mysteriously boarded up and removed from the floor pans. That is awesome. <laughs> I like the show already. I don't know why that's such an appealing concept, but it is. It's like, you know, I'd have like, can you imagine just being at school being like, oh my god, there's a secret swimming pool that no one knows about? Be like, oh my, that would be epic. I'd watch that TV show and then I'd go to school the next day and be like, oh. Reality school is so disappointingly boring. <laughs> and with good reason, it turns out the pool was built on top of a haunted graveyard. That just sounds like it makes it more interesting, to be honest. And now is inhabited by a gruesome, rotting corpse who is keen to sink his teeth into anyone brave enough to try and take a quick dip. The fear factor is ramped up by the show's trademark technique of gradually building up the tension and suspense before the terrifying big reveal, and the corpse rising out of the water to feast on its young prey wouldn't have looked entirely out of place in a proper grisly adult horror movie. Even today, some of the show's original viewers look back in fright at the most traumatizing scene they ever glimpsed through their trembling fingers at a Saturday tea time. <laughs> Yeah, this does sound pretty intense, doesn't it? <laughs> Perhaps one of the most really disturbing elements of the show is that not every episode had a happy ending. I was convinced as a very young kid that every TV or film show concluded on a positive note. It didn't matter so much how much peril and horror you were witnessing on the screen if everybody ultimately lived happily ever after and your troubled mind was calmed and eased by a peaceful resolution in which the goodies win the day and the baddies are vanquished. It's just a guy in a mask! This wasn't always the case with Are You Afraid of the Dark, in which a child's worst fear were left to fester in the mines long after the credits had rolled. It's like, yeah, what happened to that abandoned swimming pool? Well, uh, yeah, we boarded it up. Three of our friends died. There's now seven kids around the campfire, and uh, honestly, it could happen again. Someone else could open it up, and I mean, we couldn't get rid of that demon. <laughs> oh my god. In the tale of the Chameleons, the lead character Sharon realizes that her best friend Janice has been duplicated into an evil Chameleon and now has to figure out which Janice is real and which one is the sinister fake. Fortunately, she appears to make the right call and the evil Chameleon Janice is thrown down a well as Sharon heads off for another adventure with the real Janice. Unfortunately, Sharon is dumb and <laughs> Daddy, sometimes it's just so matter of fact. <laughs> Unfortunately, Sharon is of low intelligence. <laughs>
And the closing seconds reveal that she's actually abandoned the real version of her best buddy down that well. Oh no! Like, permanently? <laughs> ah! And in the, that's the end of the episode! Oh my god, that is savage! And in the turn of the wisdom glass, young viewers are reminded that theft and software piracy are heinous crimes with very serious consequences. Oh my god. Have we, we've mentioned that advert before. Or it's like, you wouldn't steal a car. So why would you steal a CD? And it's like, well, one's theft and one's copyright infringement. They're two different things. <laughs> That's like saying, you wouldn't murder. So why would you steal? I don't know, because I definitely see murder as a worse crime than theft. <laughs> Obviously. A couple of kids steal a computer game and find themselves trapped within the dark realm of the game where they are ultimately sentenced to death by guillotine for being so bloody naughty. Uh, I suspect Nintendo may have sponsored that, I was just gonna say. Has this- was this paid for by a games company? In the next episode, four kids are murdered for pirating the Foo Fighters album on LimeWire. <laughs> Brought to you by the RIAA! Can you download the Foo Fighters? Uh, yeah. Hold on. The show itself, uh, allegedly, the show itself looked destined for a happy ending though, despite the original failing, falling of the axe in 1996. Are You Afraid of the Dark is currently enjoying a second revival on Nickelodeon and appears to show remarkable spirit in coming back from the dead. Woohoo! Let's teach children lessons about not pirating stuff. Ah, please. As if they're gonna listen. I never pirated anything in my life. <laughs> never, ever. Why would you do that? Just pay for everything. No. No, I don't think I will. The animals are farthing woods. Although we often associate scary kids TV with the supernatural, perhaps the most truly frightening thing a TV show can ever do is to show a young mind the grim horrors of reality. And that appears to be the idea behind the British French animated production, The Animals of Farthing Wood, which ran for three seasons between 1992 and 1995. I vaguely remember The Animals of Farthing Wood. I'm almost certain I've seen it. I'm sure I'm gonna remember it when Danny talks about it. But I don't really remember anything about it now. I'm fairly sure a fox was the main character. Uh, but that that's all. Based on a series of 1970 books by Colin Dunn, the show initially follows the journey of a gang of adorable animals who are forced to leave their idyllic home in Farthingwood when humans start tearing down their natural habitat villas and new houses and a couple of branches of Taco Bell. Yes, I remember this. It's all about the Taco Bell. Um, and it's Taco, everybody. Every time Simon says Taco, ah, Taco! What is this? It's Taco! And I'm like, Taco? Makes me sad. It's not how we say it in the UK, but if anyone says Taco Bell in the UK, it's like, oh my god, you st it just makes you sound incredibly posh. Like, oh yeah, so well, after I've done playing some polo, I'm going to pop down to the old Taco Bell, which also is where anyone who plays polo would never eat. Um, and also, that's how you say it in America. Not the rest. I don't know how the rest of the world says it, not in the UK. That's for goddamn sure! Oh, and also, I know it's Chameleon, not Chameleon. Um, but the comments are probably fun on this one up until this point where everyone's like, oh, edit, delete, edit, delete. Some people forget though, or don't make it this far. Those are the big brains. <laughs> Their long journey to a new ho home in White Deer Park sounds like it might involve the warm-hearted frolics of a furry woodland, a furry woodland pals who get into mischief along babbling brooks as they make their way towards a new paradise while they'll be safe from the interference and destruction of the pesky humans. Ah, oh, there's a there was a movie called I think it's called Watership Down, and the beginning was so scary as a kid. It's like all the animals, there's blood running everywhere. There's like it's like this. It's so scary. F***ing Watership Down. As scary as a kid. I realize now I just haven't, like at the beginning I was like, I don't remember anything scary from children's TV shows as a kid. And it's like, oh no, I just needed to be reminded of all the terror. <laughs> I'm afraid. Ha! Gay! But it's nothing of the sort. The animal father of Farthing Wood is a barbaric bloodbath with a higher body count than the most decent gangster films. The opening scene of the very first episode sets the tone for the anguish in store. An exhausted old toad is struggling to make his way back to his digs in Farthing Wood when he's suddenly scooped up by a digger and flung into a mountain of dirt and rubble. Toad manages to survive that opening ordeal, but 
Many of his woodland pals wouldn't be so lucky over the course of the following 39 episodes, in which there are no less than 24 deaths of main characters. The death toll includes the lovable, bumbling couple, Mr. and Mrs. Pheasant, who this is so savage. You can't kill off characters in kids' TV shows. You just gotta replace them and throw them down a well. You what? Who investigate the potential sanctuary of a farmhouse, only for Mrs. Pheasant to be ruthlessly shot dead by the farmer. Oh my god. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> When Mr. Pheasant later returns to the scene of the crime, he recalls at the sight of his roasted wife's carcass being served up at the dinner table. And sadly, it's the last thing you'll see before he too is gunned down by the farmer. Oh my god. I, I don't remember this. Barely sure I've seen it though. So I just have to block this out because that is horrible. There's a lovely little scene in which the field mice give birth to a litter of little babies, and we're not given much time to save in the special moments. After a whole episode detailing the attempts to keep the baby mice safe from harm, a bird of prey called the Shrike seizes the baby mice and then swiftly impales them all on a thorn bush, which is apparently common behavior for, the butcher, for a butcher bird. The distraught mothers can only wail in anguish as the camera lingers for an extraordinarily long time on the blood oozing from the bodies of the impaled mice babies. I am so sure that I saw this TV show. And now I'm like, I definitely blocked this TV show out because it was too terrifying. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Hedgehog very nearly made it. They only had to cross one last road to reach their new home in White Deer Park. Oh my god. <laughs> but halfway across the road, Mr. Mrs. Hedgehog freezes in fear at the sight of a massive truck and curls up into a ball. She begs her husband not to do the same, but Mr. Hedgehog ignores her pleas and curls up in a ball beside her to offer one last spike of comfort before they're both splattered by the wheels of the oncoming vehicle. <laughs> oh my god, really? Some of the deaths might seem... Just a little bit gratuitous. Yes, Danny. A family of newts come across a nice pond along the journey and decide to leave the main group to make a new home in the marsh. The story could have ended there, but it doesn't. By the end of the episode, they've all perished in a blaze sparked by some thoughtless human tossing a cigarette into the marshland. Look, I get... Wait, why did the marshland just catch on fire? <laughs> Isn't it very wet? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe there's some reason. It was full of methane. Who cares? Who knows? Um, and I agree that we should teach children about like the environment and not littering and all that but do we have to do it this way? Yes! Yes! Even when surviving animals get to White Deer Park, they only face further chapters of intense misery when they encounter a villainous blue fox named after everyone's favorite coke-addled drug lord, Scarface. Oh my god. Who seems determined to work his way through the rest of the main cast in the most graphic ways imaginable. Of course, it could be argued that this show is imparting valuable life lessons to the young audience on mankind's catastrophic impact on the environment, the brutality of nature, and why you should never toss a cigarette into marshland. Just don't toss your cigarettes anyway. Put them in a bin or on the little disposable disposing thing on the top of the bin so the bin doesn't catch on fire. Look, we're not here for lessons, but we should be... We should, why do we have to teach children this in the most horrible way imaginable? And believe it or not, the water was... The material was actually water shipped down from the original series of books, which can... Wait, this is a reference to water shipped... Water shipped down, which was also scary. Am I confusing these two things? I don't know. But Danny just made a reference, which I don't think I brought up before, unless Danny can read my mind in the future, which would be crazy. Uh, but the original children's books contained content deemed too disturbing for even this tele televisual journey into the blood-drenched fields of despair. But I suspect that the series wouldn't be made in quite the same way today. Producers are now likely to adopt a more sensitive approach to the conveyance of ecological messages which don't involve the audience screaming with uncontrollable grief at the splattered hedgehog or a baby mouse or Mrs. Pheasant's roasted body. What the f**k, TV? Still, I reckon while most contemporary adult shows such as Game of Thrones or The Walking Dead have gathered acclaim for confounding our expectations by killing off leading characters every week, it's clear to me that both were heavily influenced by the animals of Farthing Wood. And I think my stomach would stand more chance of enduring the whole of The Walking Dead than it would a complete box set of the relentless Woodland Massacre. <laughs> I don't know, Danny, the, wood, the Walking Dead's pretty intense. I mentioned it in an episode really recently that I stopped watching it because it was too intense. I just hope it's not true that the very last episode of Farthing Wood concludes with the few surviving members of the cast getting battered to death by Mr. Nosy Bonk as the woodland falls silent under the shadow of a massive atomic bomb. Yes! Thank you everybody for watching. Check out Keeps. There's a link below and I'll see you next time. There's a tissue in my pocket. It felt slightly uncomfortable. How dare you!